What we say Shemp's place is in comedy history. I use the word excitement when I talk about Shem. Quite frankly, he's the original Stooge. He's the guy who saved the Stooges. He's probably the most underrated of all of these kind of comics I can think of. I think he was very funny, very versatile. Basically, what he needs to do is to rise above, not fly under the radar anymore for people to recognize just how good he was. And no more Shemp camps, curly camps. Jeff Dale, much more than a stooge, Shem Howard. And it's Jeff, by the way, not G-Off, as some people call him. Yes, that is the voice of Jeff Dale, author, as you just heard, of much more than a stooge, Shemp Howard. And you've tuned into another episode of Comedy History 101, where we school you in comedy. I am Herman. Hello, how is everyone? And today we are going to do a deep dive into the history of Shem Powered of the Three Stooges. And by no means was he an underrated stooge. What you'll soon learn is he was the original stooge. And a couple of teasers, you are going to learn why he should be called the fourth stooge. Yes, Shemp Howard was the guy who actually started the Three Stooges. He went on to appear in 76 Three Stooges shorts and one feature film. He was the older brother of Moe. You're going to learn about why he was called the ugliest man in Hollywood. And also about the lore of the fake Shemps. I love the fake Shemps. But before we jump into the episode, remember, show Comedy History 101 a little love by taking some time to like, subscribe, and comment wherever you get your fine podcasts. Also, a few quick plugs. On Friday, December 15th at the Talon Bar in Brooklyn, I'll be presenting my show, The Roast of Graham Parsons. Yes, it's a dark comedy musical storytelling show framed around the music of Graham Parsons involving one of the most debauched stories in rock and roll history. I'm very excited. I wrote the script and I'm collaborating with some very talented musicians and actors and we are putting it on its feet on Friday, December 15th. Also, on December 21st, Thursday at Young Ethel's in Park Slope, I'll be presenting my show, That 80s Improv Challenge. Yes, three improv teams create scenes and compete by creating scenes inspired by videos from the 1980s. Also, on January 7th, mark your calendar at the People's Improv Theater in New York City, 7 p.m. I'll be presenting my show, AI vs. Human Roast Battle. Yes, a human comedian takes on a machine learning AI in a comedy roast battle of tomorrow. And you can find out about all these tour dates on my website, HarmonLeon.com, or on social media, at HarmonLeon. And in general, you can find out more about Comedy History 101 at our site, ComedyHistory101.com. And now, without further ado... You're stupid. Everybody's so stupid. I'm trying to use the phone! Excuse me! Comedy History 101. So where are you at then? I'm in Brooklyn, New York. Which, ironically, is the birthplace of the Three Stooges. Yes, that's that's true. The the real Three Stooges. Or as we like to call them now in the business, the original Four Stooges. So just to make that absolutely plain. I guess my question is, what attracted you to write about Shemp out of all the other Stooges? Oh, well, really, really simple. This is a great question. I love it. I I, I love it because it's pivotal. The Stooges essentially, not as the name, the Three Stooges, but the beginnings of the Stooges started in 1923. That's 100 years ago. In that time, there's been anywhere between 40 and 50 books written about the Stooges. And that would be like books on Curly, books on Larry, the group as the group, things like film locations, 
some great books out there. And you know something? Not one single shampoo. So it, it left me wondering, well, this is ridiculous. I mean, he's the, the, he's the original stooge. You know, basically, here's his wife saying he's the first professional stooge that Ted Healy ever had. And nothing has been written. So I thought, well, here I am up in the, up in the cold. Well, up, it, was the, it was the heat <laughs> when I started writing it. And uh, I thought, I'm going to write it. Let's see what, what goes. And, you know, nothing, nothing, nothing. No one's ever written. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, bingo, I got a publisher. I got an American publisher, you know, where the dollar's worth a dollar. And uh, it, we're not quite worth a dollar. So I was quite happy. And I was thinking, good Lord, I'm going to be writing the very first book ever written on Champ. In 100 years, no one has come forth and wanted. There's people who've wanted to do it. And because I don't know what it was. Were they afraid to do it? Were they afraid to uh, sort of be disruptive? If we remember this particular podcast for anything, this is what I would like to remember it by, is the day that you and I, maybe you particularly, put an end to the, 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 the curly camp and the shemp camp. And let's just say they're two really great performers, absolutely different performers, but let's all get together and like all of them. You know, because especially the, the four originals and the two that came after, because they're all part of a hundred years of comedy. And how many can say that? I mean, you probably and, and others like yourself remember Lauren Hardy and Evan Costello and Marx Brothers. But a lot of people out there, just the common uh, Jack and Jills and Joes, they say, who? What? Stooges. Oh, yeah, I know this. I know the Stooges. And that's a fact. And read my book, and you'll find out academics teaching courses on entertainment history do the same thing. Put your hands up. Those who recognize uh, Lauren Hardy, nobody. Most brothers, maybe one or two. The Stooges, everyone in the class, including women. There you go. Yeah, and how <laughs> would you describe Shemp's style? You know, like Mo, the boss. You know, yeah. really was kind of like the child. How would you describe, like, Shemp's dynamic in, in the whole stooge mechanism well he's he's a little different in a sense because you got the larry who's sort of the reactionary the middle stooge kind of quiet incredibly funny faces oh he had the most magnificent face but but champ is, is strange because he's known in his own as a solo act and part of the stooges he's a very physical comedian just like the others and by the way he would actually not get to the point where he'd, you know, take a, a slug at all, but he'd get close. He looked almost as someone said he looked at, like, like kind of a mean Mo. That you know, he's a little <laughs> taller, and he maybe you know smack Mo around. So he's physical. He's also what a lot of directors like Jules White didn't particularly like, unless you were curly, didn't like ad libbers. But and Champ was known as being a real ad libber. So while we think we're we're born into the the generation of ad libbers like uh, Robin Williams and George Carlin and uh, you know and Richard Pryor and people like that, way 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 back, there was a lot of ad libbing. Champ was known for being a really good ad libber, and he would do it while he could. So he did that. He did the physical comedy. He was awarded, as of course you know, the ugliest man in Hollywood. By the way, which was a promotional gimmick. Yeah, I was going to ask you what who what was the promotion gimmick behind that. And well, it stuck with it. <laughs> well, it was he, he was on the, he was on the set of one movie at one point. So at the end of the end of the flick or close to it, they said, <clears throat> "We need some good promo. We get we got to work on some promo for you. How about we do this competition, The, the Ugliest Man in Hollywood?" And like, great, you know, it's sort of a self-deprecating humor like that. Champ was all in favor. Yeah, go ahead. I'll I'll play along with it. He's he's always saying how he says I, he says I'm grotesque. I am absolutely grotesque. So they had a couple of stars there. I think one was Virginia Bruce. I hope so. I know the experts out there are going to say, no, it wasn't her. Anyway, they gave him a trophy and awarded him this. And, you know, he said how honored he was to be truly the ugliest man anywhere in Hollywood. And the very next movie he appears in is called Pittsburgh. The stars of the film are his one of his neighbors, John Wayne, the Duke, Marlena Dietrich, and Randolph Scott. And on this great big poster, which is in the book, they say those stars and introducing the ugliest man in Hollywood, <laughs> Champ Howard. So it became like a little shtick 
that he could he could sort of uh, you know grasp a hold of, and he had a nice part in in Pittsburgh. So you know he he may do with that. And there you look at him. And there's a six foot three or six foot four John Wayne, towering over Shemp. But there's Shemp. You know he's <clears throat> the ugly Shemp, the ugliest man in Hollywood, running around John Wayne to such an extent that you would thought they were the same size. It's just two big Hollywood stars. You know, I mean, obviously one's taller than the other, but there was no, like, he shrinks back into the, uh, the sort of the background. And so that little shtick of his, the ugliest man in Hollywood, was just a very, very, very clever ploy of his public relations team. Great time for public relations. You're stupid. Everybody's so stupid. And again, you know, I, I think, like, your average person, they know Mo, they know Larry, they know Curly. Oh. For the people, you know, that aren't us, how yes. would you describe the underrated Stooge Shemp? I would say he doesn't deserve to be underrated. He is, in fact, the original Stooge. He's not one of the original. He is, in fact, as his wife would say, when Ted Healy was looking for Stooges to back up his vaudeville act, which was him and his wife, he was looking and he found two people. His childhood buddy, Mo who's a little younger than Shemp, and Shemp, who's older. And Shemp became, I'd say, from about 1923 to about 1930, thereabouts. He became the constant. He was there almost all of the time. No other stooge. You can name him. Larry came along in 1928. Moe was there right from the beginning, but he took off and became a – he did real estate for a while, just like his mom did. So he was gone for a while. And then there was people like Freddie Sanborn, Dick Curtis, all kinds of them. But Shemp, Shemp was the constant. He was the Stooge. Through research, he basically, Shemp was to the Stooges what Brian Jones was to the Rolling Stones. He's the guy that created the Stooges. And what, so when Ted Healy came along, childhood friend, a mo. At, at what point were they in the comedy team of Howard and Howard, which was Shemp and Mo together? No, not really. Uh, that was all very, you know, let's do something over here today. Let's go up on the stage today. Yeah, there was no real formality. In fact, the first time they were even mentioned as part of the act, they were, I think it was something to the effect of two sloppy looking goofs. And that was in the billing. I know that's that's probably not correct because I don't have it exactly in front of me. They didn't even get billed properly. And the first time when they were, uh, Shemp was Shemp. Mo was Harry because that was his first name. Moses Harry Howard. So Harry. Yeah. And Shemp, Sam Horowitz. Am I correct on uh, yeah. his, his real name? Well, if you want to be completely correct as far as the Jewish goes, you could go back to Shmuel, which essentially is Jewish for uh, Samuel and Samuel, of course, became, well, it became Shemp because when his mother used to call him for dinner and uh, she had a very strong Lithuanian accent and the kids all thought she was saying, Shemp, Shemp, and they thought, Shemp, what's that? So I thought, I like that. That's cool. He's Shemp now. From now on, he's Shemp. And that's how his name was born, thanks to his dear old mom. And then when, he, when they started going on with Ted Healy, at what point did they get billed as the Stooges? Was that when, like, Larry Fine join the act classically trained violinist larry fine i might add <laughs> yes and and a, a boxer too a, a amateur boxer and a pro boxer no they did not at any point become the stooges i mean they were his stooges with a small s they were not the stooges i think they may have been referred to that in a couple of newspapers clippings that i ran across you know ted healy and his stooges but that was not an official name it was like names like the Southern Gentleman, that was one. And, and when, of course, they broke off for themselves for a while, it was Howard Fine and Howard. And that was a little uh, later. That was, you know, once once uh, Larry was really a big member. But, like, it was all sort of a helter-skelter at that point. You know, you had Freddie Sanborn. He was along for the ride for a fair bit of the time, you know, doing his mute act. He also played the xylophone. And uh, you probably know about the movie they made, Soup the Nuts which was in uh, it was a feature film. That was the movie that the critics sort of thought, yeah, it wasn't really much of anything. It was a great piece of history, uh, but it was it was designed as a as a starring role, or role for Ted Healy, but the only people who got noticed really were in fact guess who? 
Shemp, Mo, and Larry. And uh, that, that didn't sit too well with some people, but they got noticed. I'm trying to use the phone! How would you describe Ted Healy? He had sort of his ups and downs. At one point, and it's funny, you can find this footage, he replaced the Stooges with kind of guys that look very similar to the Stooges without the yeah. charisma. <laughs> yeah, and that was that was sort of commonplace all through that time. I mean, Ted Healy was like a mega, mega star. I mean, you're looking for the word for him. He was like what we call today, I guess, a superstar or something of that nature, because he did it all. I mean, he was, you know, he went live, he did recorded stuff, he did, he was on the radio, some did some film. And there's a whole whack of really, really incredibly in- inaccurate, totally false stories about him being brutal and just outright mean to the Stooges. Not, none of that's true. He did not try to blow up buildings and all that kind of nonsense. <laughs> but and, and unfortunately, stuff like that, even today, gets sort of sort of expanded a little because we've got the internet. And of course, people are now, they're promoting this and posting this as if it's fact, and it's not. I mean, he had his own personal problems. Everyone did. I mean, what, what performer do you not know then and now that doesn't have maybe a drinking problem, maybe a little on the uh, the coke side, things of that nature. Uh, I'm not saying he was on that, but let's just say whatever. He had his personal problems, but uh, he was highly respected. Shemp's quote for him was, Ted Healy is the funniest man I've ever met and known. And Mo and him were very, very close. So he's a great, great teacher. That's above all. I mean, he taught. If, if you were looking to see why did Mo and Curly and Larry and Shem all seemed to be able to own a piece of the stage or the screen when they were up against guys like about six foot tall, six foot two. That's because of Ted Healy. He, he taught them how to do it. And he knew, and, and Shem especially was really good. I mean, Shem, Shem was the, 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 the tall dude, you know. I think he was uh, on an on a ordinary day, he was 5'5", five, five, better day, 5'6", <laughs> and in a really good day, he was 5'7". Depends on what bio you look to. But, you know, you put him up against the big, huge star of the day. Shemp didn't look out of place at all. He just fit in. Fit like a glove. It, it, what, what is the term? that it, Stooge is like a vaudeville term, right? Is it Does it mean assistant? Or or what well, does that mean? Yeah, in a sense, you could say assistant. But they're, they're also the, the, the menian who basically could take a slap, a poke in the eye, which is a Stoogeism, by the way, for sure, the poke in the eye kick up the rear, that kind of stuff. Done all very, very forcefully, but in most cases done without a great deal of injury. I mean, they got injured. Believe me, they certainly did. But considering what they could have gotten into, you know, they could have come away really bruised and battered. But they were menians. They were not co-stars. They were not up there. They were up there a lot of the time, even sometimes joining in in some of the melodies because Healy would also write songs too lyrics and music so they were there and they were important very important now you have you have four stooges that you could have written about you could have spanned mm-hmm. that to six if you uh yep. biography of curly joe and uh was was the one in between joe besser i think mm-hmm. joe besser joe besser actually and and champ were quite good friends they appeared in a movie the independent film made by Abbott and costello called africa screams they had their fair share of time, not a great deal of time. I thought they were quite funny. I thought it was a really interesting watch, too, because, again, another big piece of history. Two quite close friends, Joe and his uh, his wife, used to show up at these big, big, big parties that Champ and his wife, Babe, used to hold. And they're not necessarily weekend parties. So when they get the big stars out there. They appeared on... Uh, on that one particular movie, 1949, Africa Screams. That's the point, by the way, where Champ had rejoined the Stooges. But there was this, this was hanging there waiting, and there was no problem. Mo said, go ahead, do your thing. Excuse me! It was 15 years until he rejoined the Stooges again. But he was like working, it was like in W.C. Fields, the bank dick. Was, wasn't he, like, at one point paired with Lon Chaney Jr., you know, cinema's first wolfman, as, like, yeah, an Abbott well, and Costello-type act? There's there's another, that's another 
I use the word excitement when I talk about Jim, and I, I try to sit still for a little while, but I do get get the bounce after a while. That was an exciting bit for me. San Antonio uh, Rose was the name of the film. They pay a couple of sort of bumbling crooks, you know, not on the level of, of Evan Costello, perhaps, but it worked. It was funny. I, I thought, great stuff. He can do stuff like this. This is where the versatility comes in. Uh, another one, if you ever want to see anyone out there, when this, when the podcast is over, go to YouTube or Google or whatever, and just Google or YouTube a word, the words up, Convention Girl, 1935. It's not a particularly good movie. It's one of those, it's one of those kind of so, so bad it's good. And there's a reason actually, because they just passed the, the Hayes Code before that to clean Hollywood up. So to be perfectly honest, a movie that's going to be about, how can we put it politely, hostesses of Atlantic City, and you can envision what that is, and oh my God, was that ever boring? It was like nothing. The language was all cleaned up. The the wardrobes, man, nothing particularly wonderful. So all of a sudden, out of the blue, Shemp shows up, but he's not Shemp Howard. He's he's a crook. <laughs> he he's a would be murderer. He he's an embezzler. He's a he's a thief, and he he carries every single scene that he's in. So that's my 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 point there. He can be in a in a very average kind of almost uh, nondescript movie, and steal the whole thing. So that's how good he was, and how how good he could be. And I wish that producers and directors would have said, you know, something that Shemp Howard's got something. Let's let's do a little more with him. So he ended up in you know Charlie Chan movie. He ended up in Arabian Nights, Oscar nominated four Oscars nominated for five Abbott and Costello films. You name it. He was in Jimmy Stewart's very 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 first appearance on on the screen in a, in a, a Shemp short called "This is Terrible Fine Art." This is awful. I <laughs> I should know it. exactly what it's called. And uh, art trouble, art trouble, and. Jimmy Stewart, who was unknown, unbilled, and nothing. He went, gets $50, and you're saying $50. You know what $50 is worth today, exactly? I, I, I would say in- a few thousand dollars back in, like, 1930 money. Yeah, $1,222.54. That's not bad for a guy who was completely unknown. And what was his major part in the film? He got involved in some cinematic fisticuffs with Jimmy Stewart. The size of another John Wayne, except a little slimmer. It was the funniest part of the whole short. And it's even funnier is to think to yourself, you're watching and saying, isn't Shemp getting the better of Jimmy Stewart? Like, this is not <laughs> possible. So he could do it all. The one short I thought was like this, I think it's called Knife of the Party, a 1934, oh, yeah. where it was Shemp yeah. and the Stooges. Yep. <laughs> was it called Shemp and the Stooges back then? No, but people outside of the film and people who are going to it as an audience would say, yeah, Shemp's got his own stooges. Didn't really make make the grade. It was fun to watch as a piece of history again. And one of these things where you just say, okay, okay. Well, when I'm, I'm not giving it a thumbs up, uh, Roger or Gene. You know, yeah. maybe sort of, maybe a sideways thumbs. But he did it. Whatever he wanted them to do, he'd do it. And the most, I think, the best idea, other than his dramatic role, he was in the... Um, Joe Palooka series. There were two different series, but this is one for Vitaphone. He played the the uh, manager trainer, Nobby Welsh. And I, I swear that most of the headlines about that movie, deservedly so, were focused on not the fighter, Joe Palooka, but the trainer. Because why? Because his lifelong sport of choice, he loved it, had a passion for it since he was a kid to the day he died, literally to the day he died. And he knew, he knew it all. He knew the patter. He knew the movements. He knew to actually look like he fit and belonged around uh, around the ring side. Wonderful. If you get a chance to see those, see them. Wonderful stuff. And then like in 1947 when Curly, I think he had a couple strokes. I, I think Curly, <laughs> was Curly sort of living the high life? Like in a little documentary, he was kind of like a party guy. He was. He, Which he, didn't help your health. <laughs> well, you know, he used to imbibe in a little too many things. Uh, by the way, Curly also was a, I don't know if he ever won a gold medal, but he his quality of dancing was gold medal status. Yeah. He was one partier. In fact, his buddy 
back in the old days before he was actually in the business and just starting was the the famous actor George Raft who always played uh, cons and you know criminals now they used to go around this one particular club in the, in the New York area and not pick up women they basically you know all these sort of wallflowers that go around and dance with them and they'd spend a whole afternoon dancing with all these different women by the way curly was a really good looking guy he had this great big handlebar mustache you know curly thick thick mop of hair and of course that all changed later but he was a very popular guy and i always like to refer to one thing as being probably the most exciting thing i can think of about shem when he took over from curly after the strokes it was one film was called fright night it was about boxing it was written for Curly, essentially. You knew that, but you watched it. It was a seamless sort of fit into the role. He 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 was Shemp, and it was wonderful to watch. So no more no more Shemp camps, no more Curly camps. They fit in it together. Yeah, and so did Shemp particularly come back because without him coming back, the Stooges probably would have been over at that point. Yes, absolutely. I don't think there's any question. People are going to argue because they, they they continued after the fact, but that's a different part in history. This was really, really important because Curly essentially, well, Curly was the, fa- the favorite stooge. There's, there's no question about it. The man is an absolute, he's like a human cyclone. I mean, he's like a force of nature. How, how can you possibly replace a guy like that? So you do what your chimp did. You don't replace him. You do your bit. You do what you can. You show that you've got your own shtick. And basically, I'm going to follow that. And I think people have got to understand that he did it. He didn't try to become the second Curly. And I think he did a magnificent job. And they all appeared together in Hold That Line. Yes. Yeah, well, he happened to show up on on the the set that day. And the director, Jules White, said, this would be kind of cool. Why don't we get the... Curly in on a shot here, so they put him just in a, you know, this, the, a train seat, and you know he was snoring, making this un, unusual sound. And so they, the three of them were just looking at him, saying, "Oh my God, what, what, what's with this guy? Why is he making these noises?" It was great. I'm, I, again, another piece of beautiful bit of history, quite funny, and kind of touching in a way. He did appear; he was supposed to appear in Malice in the Palace too as a sort of an enraged chef with a mustache and that, that never appeared. There were sort of stage shots, photos available. They probably cost a fortune to own one. So that was the only time the original four studios ever appeared together. And it was a glorious, glorious moment. Wonderful. So then, you know, Shep had a heart attack on the way back from a boxing match, 1955. What? How come the Stooges didn't end then in the same way it didn't end could have ended when Curly was taken ill. Well, a number of reasons. You're going to get all kinds of rumors about who was considered for the role. One was supposedly Buddy Hackett, and that was not true. I believe, to the best of what I could find out, it appears to have been circulated by Buddy Hackett himself and possibly some friends. I don't see that ever happening at all. And it's it's it, it's hard to say. I mean, who was who around? Who was available to sort of take over the part? Uh, but Joe Besser, as I said, Joe Besser was in fact a friend of Shemp's. Uh, Joe Dorita, by the way, was also around at the time. That didn't happen. That of course happened later. So there were, I, I guess, in a sense, the situation was not. It was desperate in so much as they had to cobble together those last four shorts that they were. Old. Yeah, and then there's the, there's uh, what Sam Raimi, the, the <laughs> director, calls the fake shemps. Yes, had, uh, which is like a term for when you have stand-ins for an yeah. actor because they had to get fake shemps to well, and the, then put, reuse footage, correct, uh, from yeah, past films. Exactly. And, and, and the guy they got, you know, the fake shemp, because I know Sam Raimi uh, in one of his films. I don't know if it's the first evil film they had at the end of the Billings. 12 fake shemps or 13 <laughs> fake shemps whereas there was only one with uh, the stooges and that was joe palma he was in fact a, i guess you could call him a journeyman actor with columbia he appeared in several films with shemp as a solo actor and also with the stooges as, as shemp it was with the group at that point so he was a natural but uh, if you can look at some things back in those four remaining shorts and number one, the hair was a little different, yeah, kind of shaggy, but not not quite the same. Uh, I, it strikes me that Joe Palm was a, a little bit taller 
I, I don't know how much. And also, that most of the scenes were from the back, but one, there was one, at least one side shot, and you said to yourself, oh, there's the fake shim. It's Joe Palmer. And Joe, Joe Palmer in, enjoyed a bit of a career after the fact of doing bit parts uh, in Jack Lemmon movies. So he was there. Strange, strange history, but fun, sad that Shem passed on. So, And by the way, although it was reported as a heart attack, the, the Shem family say categorically it was a cerebral hemorrhage that he actually passed away from. And 60 years old, you know, it's, some people may think that's a long time for an actor to uh, last, but not these days and not when you're 73 years old yourself, you know. I've outlived them by 13 years. God, no. And just a couple of last questions here. What would we say Shemp's place is in comedy history? I, I think, quite frankly, he's the original Stooge. He's the guy who saved the Stooges. He's probably the most underrated of all of these kind of comics I can think of. I think he was very funny, very versatile. And he basically what he needs to do is to rise above, not fly under the radar anymore for people to recognize just how good he was and no more shemp camps curly camps and what did you learn about shemp through the process and research of writing this book that you didn't know that really surprised you my surprise really was i knew he had made 105 and again an adjective known films on his own because there could be more who knows i was surprised just how how different some of the roles were and how well he he sort of could demonstrate that he could do some drama quite quite effectively he could do physical comedy as well as verbal comedy as in of course ad-libbing I, I learned a lot about that and and about his just about his general demeanor and the fact that he was really respected Ab, abbott bud abbott had said in an article in collier collier's magazine he said he's one of the best around he said he, he could he could have been one of the greatest around. And, of course, then he added, had it not been for those dreadful comedy film shorts that he made, you know, by himself. But, and that, that's not a knock on him. That's a knock on the Columbia people. And so, but Abbott, he thought he was one of the greats. Absolutely. And I was surprised, very surprised. And how does his legacy live on? I know in 1983, he had a Hollywood Walk of Fame star. And you go on like Facebook and there's like Facebook groups like the Church of Shemp Howard. You mentioned like Drew Friedman, artists like yeah. that have artistically lived on his legacy. Well, he he basically, to me, I think that's what's going to happen eventually. And no, I'm not going to give you a cheap plug about my book, but if you want one, I will. But yeah, anyway, no, I good. think I think <laughs> my book, Drew Friedman especially, who is essentially, he's an absolutely brilliant illustrator. I mean, uh, who he can't do, there's no one he can't do. I mean, you could just say to him, Drew, because you do an illustration of him, bang, oh, you've got it. But he's, he's really known to Stooge fans essentially as the Shemp artist. His, his Shemp pictures are just wonderful. And I do feature that the last chapter in the book and he didn't want me to call it the drew friedman uh, chapter which some people say i was wrong in, in doing not doing so i said no i'll use what he wanted and throughout the book there's three or four of his classic shots and that one of the really handsome uh, wavy haired young shemp so clearly not the ugliest man in uh, hollywood so yeah i think his legacy is going to grow and grow and grow and one of these days people are probably maybe they're going to refer to the four stooges even the six <laughs> even the six stooges there was a facebook group the church of shemp howard and it showed a canceled shemp howard check it had an address on it i looked it up on google maps and you could see his house on the street view and the house is yeah. actually for sale yeah the shemp well, howard house on zillow one person who did was denzel washington he oh, lived he bought in a shemp house. howard house or lived oh, yeah. in that house I don't know if I, you know, I don't know, not sure about the one you're talking about because I don't have the address in front of me. However, but he did. And I would have loved to have got a hold of Denzel Washington. Just he, he talked with, uh, with uh, Mrs. Shemp. By the way, her name was Gertrude, but of course she got known as Babe. Everyone back then was Babe. You know, Oliver Hardy was Babe. You know, uh, Curly was Babe at some point. Everyone was Babe. So she was Babe. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. You, you pull all these names out of the hat. 
John Wayne, Jimmy Stewart, Denzel Washington. It's and then you then you tie them together with Shemp. So let's have all Stooges together, you know. See, now <laughs> I'm getting excited. My hands are starting to move. Yeah. It's amazing. And, and where, where can people find the book? At the present time, you can get it through my publisher, which is Bear Manor Media. Go online, you'll find it. You can also get it at Amazon. You can get it. And it depends. It doesn't matter what country you're in. Apparently, my book is available all over the world, which kind of astonishes me. You know, I'm kind of used to being just a small city uh, journalist. And you can also get it at Barnes & Noble. You can also get it at this, the Knuckleheads, Shop Knuckleheads, the, the, the main purchase site for all great things Stooge-like. And whatever you want to get, uh, I mean, go in, buy a Shemp book, and then just to make yourself feel really good and you don't believe in camps, buy a Curly book too. Even if you've got <laughs> it, get another one. Get a Larry book. And will there be more Stooge stuff from me in the future? Yes, but I can't tell you what it's about. We'll talk next time. <laughs> Okay. okay, that's that's the teaser. Thank you so much again, and I, I like your campaign of the Four Stooges. <laughs> yes, and no camps, no camps. Yeah. All right, all right, my friend. Take care. Bye. And that wraps up our interview with Jeff Dale, author of Much More Than a Stooge, Shemp Howard. Be sure to check out his book. Also, show Comedy History 101 a little love by taking some time to like, subscribe, and even comment wherever you might get your fine podcasts or on our site, Comedy History 101. You can also find us on the social medias at Comedy History 101. And if you want to know more about my upcoming shows and tour dates, you can check me out at Harmon Leon on the social medias or on my site, harmonleon.com and until next time bye bye you're stupid everybody's so stupid I'm trying to use the phone excuse me comedy history 101